Well, next we're going to jump right into our Venture Capital Dealmaker panel. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Helen Wong, a partner at Shiming Ventures. Uh, come on up. Uh, Amir Galor, a CEO of Infinity Group. Uh, Chuan Thor of Highland Capital Partners. Uh, James Liu, a business attorney with Cooley. And finally, Joshua Wu of uh, GGV Capital. We've got a lot of really uh, firepower uh, deal makers up here, so uh, please warm up your questions uh, because we'll a lot we'll a lot a little bit more extra time for a Q and A audience Q and A. We need to give. <laughs> Okay, any questions from the audience to start? What would you like them to what would you like to hear about? The venture capital bubble, the tech bubble in Silicon Valley? And how it's playing out here in China. Oh, we'd like to talk about the Alibaba IPO. <laughs> uh, what kind of impact do you think the Alibaba IPO is going to have on uh, China startups and um, going forward uh, in terms of IPOs and exits and the whole fundraising aspect for venture capital here from China? Is this going to, uh, what impact do you think it's going to have? Oh, we're gonna we're, we're actually gonna but have a okay. fight. Or no, we're no, gonna no, fight. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. I, I think it's just like um, you know, it's definitely good news uh, because the way I look at this, this is a uh, Alibaba is gonna be like the top three, I think, are worldwide world class internet companies by valuation, and also by the size of their growth. Because in the past, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, Chinese. Um, internet company they went IPO successfully um, in New York but it, they still consider as a more like a regional player okay by the size um, and uh, I think that was a yesterday there was a Wall Street Journal article to talk about the world top 10 internet company by variation actually so four of them are from China actually came from China and the rest are from the U.S. Yeah, and that wasn't the case just a few years ago. Yeah, it it's wasn't been a the case. Very big shift. Absolutely. So I think the Alibaba IPO, it definitely Jack Ma has done a great job, and and but it's actually a, it's going to be a new generation. So I talked to a couple of our invest, uh, more like our limited partners. They talk about oh now if I put a lot of money in the Silicon Valley. I should think about a portion of money should be in China. So that is kind of like yeah. the way I look. Yeah. Biggest shot. Yeah, okay. Helen, what do you think? Um, I think it's, it's definitely, you know, great news that a Chinese company actually, um, you know, when I was an, uh, an associate, I was involved with Alibaba. So it's great to, you know, from a VC perspective, it's, it's great to see an entrepreneurs that we back become so, you know, so successful. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I also wonder if, you know, Alibaba is um, somewhat peaked, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, offering a very maybe controversial view, but, um, but I think that, uh, you know, there are newcomers um, on the e-commerce uh, uh, sector that, uh, that are, I think will, will be, be a bit of a, you know, challenge to them as well. I mean, maybe, how, how should I say, maybe nibbling at what their, their market share um, I mean, we, we, you know, teaming funded uh, Moku Jie, you know, which is also another um, social commerce platform. And I think that a lot of the merchants on the Alibaba platform are not very happy with their model and uh, would want to leave the platform. So I think, you know, while yes, I think on one hand, I'm, I'm very, you know, glad for them that success. I think, um, I think innovation will always be there. So I think, you know, new companies will always come up. Um, so I think from, from the VC perspective, we're very happy that, you know, they have so much money now, but maybe they can buy some of our companies and provide exits for us. So, uh, so you know, I think it'd be good for the VC industry and probably more um, 
entrepreneurs would come out from Alibaba. So it's very good for the for the industry. Yeah, just like we saw with happened with PayPal and all these entrepreneurs who were at PayPal and then they launched other companies um, and um, and now with Alibaba with this uh, uh, new money, um, it probably be we investing a lot more into startups. Um, in the U.S. And, and China, too, I would imagine. Uh, any other views on, on the Alibaba dues? <laughs> I'm going to add in my two cents here. Um, James Liu here from Cooley. You know, I, I, I echo uh, what Chuan was just saying. I was looking at the article yesterday, the Wall Street Journal article as well. You know, just four out of the ten, I think, in, you know, in addition to BAT, JD made the, made the list as well. Um, this is positive news, I think. In many aspects, and one of which is, you know, as you know, JD went public recently and did pretty well in terms of stock performance. Um, China, Chinese stock in the United States. For those companies who are taking in U.S. dollar investments in China, um, obviously one of the most popular exit is to go public in the United States in NYSE or Nasdaq. And there had been setbacks in the past, in the past several years, and there was a huge long hiatus where you know U.S. investors were cautious about investing in Chinese companies. I think with high quality, um, you know, high market valuation, high growth, high performance companies like Alibaba and JDs, uh, the outside investors' views of Chinese companies will change. They will have to change just because the size and the growth. So this overall is great news for Chinese companies. Um, you know, it will definitely impact the, the exits um, and also uh, the, the investment activities in general. So I, I, I'm uh, very excited about it. Amir? I think two good things are quite clear. Um, China will be viewed as more entrepreneurial by the world. Um, and for Chinese people, that they know Alibaba, they know the story, there is enough heroes, global heroes as well. It's already out there. But from a global perspective, so innovative or so entrepreneurial as it is. So it's, you know, it opens up the, the curtain. So I think that's very good news. Open in terms sesame. Of Open sesame. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Open sesame. Childhood. Um, the other good thing, uh, clearly for everybody, is uh, the fact that the Chinese dream comes true in, in something so tangible on the highest level likely could be the largest company in the world in some aspect. And it's a, the ultimate China dream, and it's also the American dream. So it's, it's also a very positive for the whole, for everybody, for every Chinese person and for every entrepreneur, whatever he wants to do. Yeah, good point. Joshua, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I think um, um, the potential IPO of Alibaba has uh, special meanings to GGV and me because GGV has invested in Alibaba back in 2003. And uh, uh, prior to becoming a VC, I also worked in Alibaba in 2006 to 2008. So it's um, quite a, a very um, encouraging and um, a good news for GGV and me. And I, I always wish I could join Alibaba a little bit later, uh, earlier, and uh, and back to Alibaba. Yeah, actually, I didn't make uh, any money <laughs> out of Alibaba, and because I was uh, uh, initially with Yahoo China, um, at the same time when Alibaba acquired Yahoo, and after the merge, I you know there's a lot of uh, chaos in uh, uh, Yahoo China, um, and um, even Jack Ma, I think himself, not very clear about. Uh, how they gonna do with uh, uh, Yahoo? So, actually, uh, my work uh, as a search engine product manager in Yahoo was not very, uh, you know, uh, sustainable uh, back then. So I just left uh, Alibaba. So uh, it's just it's a story uh, shows that even big companies like Alibaba had make mistakes. You know, um, so you know, but it's still good news that Alibaba finally make it. And, I'm so happy for Jack and Jack Ma and other my ex colleagues in Alibaba, and I think a lot of other guests had mentioned this uh, uh, IPO of Alibaba is very uh, encouraging and very uh, good news for the whole industry. 
uh, especially on the make the whole world understand how big China market can be and uh, and uh, uh, you know a lot of the encouraging to other entrepreneurs and I think as I ha may I have uh, want to add something about um, uh, the potential uh, impact of Alibaba make to other uh, potential uh, entrepreneurs of uh, ex Alibaba employees um, after the IPO. I think a lot of people in Alibaba, very talented product managers, uh, developers, um, business line managers, they are thinking of you know doing their own business. Uh, but uh, obviously, I think most of the their stops may come from the uh, e-commerce sector. But I think uh, Alibaba, in some sense, become the Huangpu Junxia of our uh, sector. Just as uh, we have seen a lot of. Uh, Entrepreneurs coming out of uh, Baidu and Tencent, and now it's Alibaba. So uh, I think for uh, our VC firms, we are you know like uh, uh, keep contacting their ex uh, Alibaba uh, professionals and you know persuading them to come out and you know uh, getting their startups. Uh, so in the U.S., you probably have Google is uh, one of the top innovators. Uh, who do you see and which company in China of the major companies in China, the Baidu, the Alibaba, the Tencent, and, and a few others, which one of these do you see as the most innovative um, and why? Is Alibaba all that innovative? Because Chinese innovation is different from Silicon Valley and Israeli innovation. I've been living that for the last uh, 10 years. It's a huge difference. So when you say innovation, you must define what is innovation. Um, I think Chinese innovation is amazing, but it's uh, under a different category. Uh, there's a lot of localization to the local culture. There's a lot of micro-improvement, very practical. Disruptive innovation, um, I have not seen even one single case where I can say it's real disruptive innovation. It is a leapfrog on all aspects. But from observation, uh, I think Tencent is uh, more innovative than others. But even that, that innovation is very practical and important. Very practical innovation. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Right. Yeah, innovation is hard to say. If you're building a rocket, you can call it innovation. But you say, oh, somebody have done innovation before. That is not considered as an innovation. But the key here is that, uh, let's say, you know, um, like WeChat. Uh, to be honest, if you have been using WeChat and compare with WhatsApp, you say, wow, actually, so WeChat is more convenient and much more user-friendly than WhatsApp. So are you saying that WeChat is a copycat? That's not true, right? Is there any other ways? Uh, because uh, WeChat, for example, WeChat is using community to help. I mean, it's more like social to help you find a cab and pay it online. On the WhatsApp, you can't do that, right? And there's another thing, uh, even like Taobao is not eBay. Everybody knows it in China, right? Taobao is a more like trading information linking the small business guys with their consumers. And in an, uh, at, at our home, we, we are ordering, my wife is ordering almost everything from Taobao today. You just can't believe that. So you say that, is that a copycat of eBay? No, that's a different, right? And even like, I, I think it's like hard to say that. You know, what is the innovation? Probably somebody else got an idea initially, but you know, who is the next guy who make it to be more user-friendly? Yeah, I would say, uh, we, you asked a very good question, but after five more years, you probably wouldn't ask the question again. So you, you brought up uh, uh, the WeChat uh, example, and I was thinking about uh, Apple iPhone and the, the launch last week. Um, and uh, the, the payment ecosystem, ecosystem that they're introducing around that. Um, but isn't that uh, something that's already been done and kind of old news in China? 
Um, what's your view on, 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 on that launch and how it, how it compares to what you're seeing in China today? In terms of innovation and, and usage. My very quick, uh, uh, iPhone 6, no surprise. I, I would say it's a very disappointed. That's a personally. And, and, and this is a, um, I would say that compared with the first time, the first iPhone uh, in 2007 when I first saw it, or iPhone 2 or 3, and the innovations um, is, is not really there. I, I think it's, you know, China, you mentioned about disruptive technology. It is true that you know, in China, you, you don't see a lot of headliners, you know, on Wall Street Journal or on Wired Magazine where, you know, something is totally new or, you know, for example, Secret as a uh, anonymous, you know, social media app in the United States. They came up first and in China, there are a lot of copycats, you call them copycats. However, they are doing things, and that makes doing things that are that are different. Like if you talk about WeChat trend, a lot of things are you just don't see in in the in the United States or in Europe. Um, some of them because of the Chinese context, the, the 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 user behavior or the tradition or custom of people or their phone types or other just the environment is different. Consumer environment is different. Some uh, other. Differences are driven by purely just a, an experiment from entrepreneurs because different people are trying different things to attract, you know, um, different groups. And you know, a lot of the questions the previous uh, host, pr previous moderator asked was like, how are you differentiating be you know, between yourself and others? And every month, you know, we are a law firm. We get requests from entrepreneurs on a daily basis. They have good ideas and. And a lot of them have similar ideas, but they do try to differentiate between themselves. And that differenti differentiation process is innovation in, in my mind because they have to come up with new things that will attract investors and attract consumers. Um, and I think eventually China will come up with you know, new business models and new technologies, hard, hard technologies, um, that will impress the world. And I, I just think that they is already here. And, and it's it's we're seeing it, and and uh, I'm very optimistic about it. And in terms of your payment question, uh, I think China is way ahead of the United States in terms of electronic payments, uh, mobile mobile phone payments. I was just in the states a couple of weeks ago, and everything is so much slower now. I feel when I'm back in Shanghai, I ordered a bottle of olive oil on Saturday, Sunday morning, it's delivered to the apartment. It, it's just amazing to me. It gets spoiled, right? <laughs> um, Amir, uh, from an um, Israeli perspective, um, will China ever get to that stage of disruptive kind of breakthroughs that Israel has really, you know, excelled at? And, and what can China entrepreneurs learn from entrepreneurs in Israel? Uh, I think China does not need to at this moment. And Israel has no choice. <laughs> yeah. That's the short of it. Yeah. China has the market and has growth and has the people to do the logistics and uh, get to the next day because they work very hard. Uh, and so you, when you, Israelis have no choice there because they have no market. In Israel we have just ideas. There's no natural resources. There's no clear market even locally especially not the neighborhood, and you have to shoot for something in the future which is far away from you anyway. So that I don't think will happen in China in the near future just because there's no need. And you have enough on your local market and then global market and supply chain, the, the work, the labor. Uh, so I think for China from Israel is mostly about maybe some learning of line of thinking, um, some aspect you could localize, but to do the same ecosystem that exists in Israel and China, because of lack of need, it will not succeed. So it's not about good or bad, it's a reality. Can uh, Israel-based entrepreneurs learn lessons from China entrepreneurs? I don't think they're capable to understand. <laughs> they cannot, because yeah. 
you live from a very young age in a, an environment that glorifies ideas and does not glorifies execution. And China is amazing when it comes to execution, cost, uh, supply chains, uh, how you scale. Israelis don't know to scale and they have no clue about managing costs. Ninety-nine percent of the companies that are in Israel are losing money. They don't want to make money. I am exaggerating, of course, but the line of thinking here is: we need to create something. We don't necessarily need to make money of it because we don't have the market. So somebody else needs to take it. But if you take it to China, in some cases it will not be relevant because you need to reduce costs, adapt it to the local market. So it's possible to do it. It simply requires additional a link. So why did your fund begin to invest in China? You know, in life, everything is personal. <laughs> you know, there's uh, academic reasons, and there are formal reasons, but uh, I, I, my brother was here from around 97 in China and thought that this is a good place for high tech and innovation and some aspects of it. And we checked it out and it looks like a good adventure. Nowhere here. You know, my son is here studying here in Shanghai, and I'm neat. And I have a, another son in Beida, and uh, it's an adventure. So the answer is it's an amazing place, it's fun, and, uh, and we are a venture capitalists. We look for venture. Here is venture. Any regrets? Nah. <laughs> First, it's not good line of thinking. Practically, you know, we just had a good time. We have good investments. We, uh, see, otherwise, I would not let my kids be here. So what kind of returns have you had out of China? And uh, how does it compare to Israel? Well, it's, it's very different. Um, in China, or you go big, big, or you struggle. Not many middle cases. So the success stories we have are very big. Uh, with others, you really struggle. And so, are you scale or you don't? In Israel, you have many cases that could drag, like medical or agriculture, they can drag for 15, 20 years. And here it's more you know, winner or losers, which is, by the way, part of the hierarchy DNA of the country. Interesting. So, uh, looking down the tech spectrum, uh, I'd like to hear each one of your views of, of what you see as uh, hot emerging areas in China that are going to attract a lot of venture capital money, that are going to be the tomorrow's success stories. Uh, we heard tonight about wearables. Uh, we heard about gaming. Uh, you know, there's cloud computing. There's the Internet of Things. Um, uh, you've got all of these areas of technology today that it's much more diverse than it, than it was a couple years ago. So what areas do you see in China that are really going to um, be tomorrow's winners? Um, well, at Qiming, um we focus on a few areas. Um, so you mentioned like um, cloud computing, big data, um, definitely wearables as well. Uh, for myself, I focus more on the mobile internet. So uh, within the mobile internet area, uh, we, we have what we call the Lovi strategy, uh, which is location, uh, voice, and image. So we focus on... Um, mobile internet companies that uh, leverage these, um, these areas uh, because we believe that um, they, they really differentiate um, in a mobile environment, right? You, you, have, um, you have a lot of LBS applications, you have a lot of um, images that are produced. So um, we think that the young users, especially the um, you know, post-85, uh, 90s users, will um, express themselves in different ways because um, the technology allows them to do so. Uh, so, for example, like in, in the U.S., like Instagram um, is very popular. Uh, so, in China, we also invested in uh, Meitu Xiu Xiu, uh, which is uh, it's a very similar uh, photo um, sharing tool. Photo, uh, and they also have video, which is a bit like Vine. So, um, so these are the kind of companies that uh, we're looking at. Uh, I, I would say um, definitely over the next uh, five years, um, the mobile definitely continue um, to go growth um, but from that 
one perspective which is very important is that uh, it's going to be combination. Uh, when we talk about mobile, this is going to be more like mobile social, mobile social. And I think a lot of us are now are using WeChat. Um, but I can tell you that WeChat is not good enough, really. And check about um, the groups you have, your members you have on your WeChat now, how many of them are actively communicate with you. Very few. You will see you have a lot of people on your WeChat list, but a lot of them have been quiet. And I, I think there's a, it's a very interesting, you know, WeChat, what WeChat is replacing, what WeChat have, has replaced in our cell phone. I learned about that. The thing is that um, I would say uh, WeChat replaced my SMS, short messaging. Okay, and now it's more like a phone call. So the way I look at WeChat is a more position, is a communication. Instead of, uh, we do have uh, some, you know, media, social sharing, but I found that a lot of them not, are not actively posting their information on there. So, so what do you see coming up? That's it's coming be up. Really it's more about the mobile, social, and it's uh, online to offline. Yeah, I mean, for example, you use, uh, now, I mean, the most popular one is that you can use a uh, WeChat to, you know, to book a taxi, to pay on the taxi. But this is a, which is a, just a starter. You will see, let's say, hey, we chit chat on the, on the mobile social, we talk about, hey, where do you have your dinner? Oh, that was a, a steakhouse, which is very good. And I can give you numbers, like since 2010, uh, there were around 16 Chinese tech companies went IPO in New York. Today, they all of the 16 traded above one billion dollar market cap. And 15 of them are consumers, B2C. And this is how all the VC guys make money, okay? But w I would say that over the next five years, I think we will see more enterprise. With market cap, they can go IPO with market cap over billion dollars. Uh, in the U.S., which is very common, you see like Google, all those companies, they're consumer facing, they're billion dollars. But on the other hand, you see like most recently Palo Alto Networks, you know, Fire Eyes, all these enterprise companies, they also trade over billion, four to five billion dollars. But in China, we haven't seen a lot of them trade above a billion dollars. Okay. There's no real Salesforce.com in China. Yeah, you haven't right? seen that. But... What is going to change it, which is very interesting, is that, um, like you talk about security, enterprise security has become so interesting here. Um, like one of a company I invested uh, six years ago, I, I can tell you that they couldn't make a very good business. Their sales was, uh, how much was it? Maybe less than one million US dollar in six years ago. And last year, uh, this year, uh, they're going to generate about $35 million only in China. And enterprise users are paying that. I, I think it was very interesting. Why five years ago, six years ago, enterprise users told us that they didn't need that. And now we found that most of the enterprise who are selling staff to consumer have their own mobile side or e-commerce side. Okay? Transaction. Just a C trip, and um, if you you might recall that uh, a few months ago, there was a leak of uh, credit card information up from C trip. Okay, if you want to sell a lot of things as an enterprise, now you need security to protect, and everyone now put their e-commerce, their user information on the cloud. So you need a cloud security. So with cloud and mobile and big data, all this makes security a much bigger issue. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so yeah. But let me just move on down to uh, Joshua uh, from. Um, uh, I think I give us your perspective from GGB. Oh, yeah, it's just my perspective. Oh, uh, your perspective that um, makes it more interesting, actually. <laughs> uh, I totally agree that mobile, social, technology, cloud computing are going to be very big and very influential, but. I'm particularly interested in some 
traditional sectors that is low efficient but could potentially tackle the improved in a in, in a technical way, uh, namely internet finance, uh, internet healthcare, and uh, other some some uh, public uh, uh, surveys and government, and particularly finance and healthcare. And um, think about um, how suffering it is uh, experienced when you go to see a doctor in a hospital. I think that was very. Uh, you know, every Chinese could understand what I'm talking about, and think about financing. You know, um, think about lending club. The emergence of P2P finance that would be very, very, you know, uh, uh, convenient for the lenders and borrowers. And and when you look back to China, and then you, if you, someone wants to apply for a credit line for a, for a, a credit uh, for for loan, it, it was suffering. It was. It is very difficult for especially small and uh, medium enterprise and uh, individuals to get a, a loan from a bank. So um, I think uh, thanks to the internet, we have come up with some uh, solutions to that problem. I think that these industries uh, will see a big, uh, at least uh, a user value uh, out of it. And uh, um, for example, um, there's a lot of uh, innovations in internet finance. In addition to P2P, we see a lot of users uh, put, put their uh, data to a mobile app so that they can have better understanding what, of what they're spending on, just like Mint in USA. And in, uh, in healthcare, and we, uh, instead of going to hospital to, to queuing a lot for like, virtually uh, you know, eight hours to, get a, to, to see the doctor, you can just to talk to a doctor in an app, you know, just to, uh, as easy as WeChat. And these innovations, you may, it's not a high tech, raw case science technology, but it really, really helps everybody's uh, daily life. And uh, uh, when it, we continue to see finance and healthcare uh, continue to be relatively low efficient in China, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, because of a lot of reasons. So uh, internet as an approach and a, uh, as a sol one of the solutions may help a lot. So uh, there's, um, we've just followed the uh, user value. So I think uh, these two industries have a lot of potential in China, particularly right now. Yeah, a lot of need. Uh, Amir, from your perspective. No, I think two sectors I predict also, though it's difficult to predict uh, venture capital. And two, I hope. Okay. So the two I predict is uh, medical, but medical not necessarily on the service side, which is important, or the internet side, but also on the medical devices side, on the, the real medical aspect of things. Uh, I think China is a huge but need. Biotech, you're talking about then. No, not necessarily. Not biotech. biotech. Biotech is more complex, but also biotech. Medical devices, maybe devices. It's, a little bit shorter cycle, less risk uh, than biotech itself, but medical devices are very simple and they can be Cosmo Medical, which is more cosmetic medical, which is a shorter cycle all the way to biotech, which is much longer cycles. But there will be a, most likely more and more money, resources in need around the whole world of medical, just because of the reforms, the needs, the awareness, that's a whole quite huge world. And the other sector is, uh, in the IT world, is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, but the people-to-people, -people, uh, sharing economy. That, that's, uh, yeah, is, uh, although U.S. is leading by far, but uh, in the Chinese culture, uh, if you can solve the kind of, I think, it's relatively thin uh, block, which is a trust issue. If, if you can bypass some aspect of trust that are uh, deeper in the society, that Basic Chinese culture is a sharing uh, culture. So I think the peer to peer, the sharing economy is, is quite huge. Mm -hmm. um, two sectors I hope, uh, because they have barriers, is uh, one agriculture. Uh, there is a lot of willingness, there is a need, but there's too many barriers to block for real agriculture becoming a venture business or a real business. So you have some around agrotech and some around IT and agriculture. Still, one that can explain one day why it's, it's difficult. And the other one, I hope, is education. Um, 
not education in the sense of finding a job in the United States or going to university in the United States or learning English, because this is kind of basic and old news. Education on the real reform of it, which is more free education and personal education, um, the potential is huge. Um, whether Are you optimistic about online education? I think it's all over the place. There's a lot, but there are no clear uh, models. And, uh, and easy, like e-commerce is easy, right? You buy and sell a product. Education is less tangible. It's more complicated. But I, I do hope that these two sectors, which actually benefit human beings on top of medical, uh, will emerge. Uh, James, uh, as a lawyer, you're seeing a lot of deals getting funded and new companies getting raising money and sure, yeah. yeah. So we are a service provider. We we don't predict and put our you know money where we <laughs> predict, uh, but we do see trends. Um, and our from our you know vantage point, you know we we are you know we have a huge presence footprint in the United States in Silicon Valley and all the other tech centers in the U.S. And we also are active, very active in in China's uh, emerging companies um, and entrepreneurship ecosystem. So we do see uh, trends, you know, obviously social media, mobile is still active, very active, uh, but I think I think we are slowly seeing people are getting more cautious. Um, you know, in the past several years, it's all about chasing the eyeballs. Uh, freak, you know, more and more we're hearing people talking about monetization strategy. I mean, we, we saw it today, like people are asking. Uh, before it's all about market share and eyeballs. Mm -hmm. um, so, So in terms of Sectors, um, enterprise would definitely see in a push um, fr from from um, both our U.S. investors coming to the U.S. and also U.S. Uh, domestic investors are more and more interested in in that. Um, another um, field that we see a lot, you know, we are we actually represent a lot of um, biotech companies in the United States, and a lot of them have R and D centers here now. Um, in the past few years, it's all about pharmaceuticals, biologics, so oncology drugs, for example. Now, slowly, people realize, Chinese investors and entrepreneurs realize how risky and how, how complicated an investment that is, how long-term investment that can be. So I think a lot of them, you're right, Amir, they are getting more and more interested in medical device, for example, much lower risk. And in terms of our relevant field here, um, things we're seeing, uh, wealth management, uh, internet finance, definitely, it's cashing up, p 2 peer lending. Um, and uh, another field, I would say travel. A lot of people are interested in travel. You know, it, it, they're dominant players there, but everybody realizes how big and how promising the Chinese mark travel market is. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people are finding different applications in that, in that area as well. Uh, yeah, uh, I think there's a question in the audience. Um, Good day. Um, it's Yang from Singa. Um, there is a phrase I was reading from the article the other day, and the more um, I think about it, the more I feel a bit scared. That is, um, do not uh, 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 do not make your product become a feature of others. Do not make your product become a feature of the other. Uh, I didn't understand it until a few days ago. Um, I've been using a, a weather app called Mo Moji Tianji uh, quite frequently, and I opened up uh, the Baidu app the other day. On top of the screen, it's actually you know because it's got an LBS, it knows where I am. It actually shows me the weather. Uh, if I'm putting myself into the you know the the founder of the Moji app, and you know I I don't think I'll be very happy to see it. Um, you know, the similar things, uh, for example. Um, it, so your question is? Uh, how to avoid your product becoming um, a feature of others. I'd love to, to get your insight on that. Thank okay. you. Uh, I, I think, yeah, just very quickly is that um, the starting point is so important. And a lot of things started from, started when it's just more. Okay, very small. I mean, for example, um, because I, I, I invested in Chihu um, back to when they were one year old, Chihu initially was just one feature, 
very tiny feature. But the key for whether it can be, what it can now be a $10 billion company, because you have to move very quickly. How you expand from one feature to the next and grow the, learn it from your user feedback, okay? And if they still today, after six years, if Chihu is still working on the tiny NT malware, and this company gone. So they learn from the user feedback, okay, where is the next security problem? Browser, what is the next security problem? And software, and then mobile. So I think you need to grow so very quick, quickly to build up your whole platform, more feature. Uh, I think there was another question here in the audience, and this may need to be our last question. Um, but the our VCs will be and our deal makers will be hanging around afterwards. So, okay, I had a couple of questions, Josh. Yeah, right. just one, please, Russell. <laughs> okay, uh, one person, two questions, maybe. Uh, um, Josh, wait, what's uh, you work for Alibaba? What's their biggest vulnerability? You mentioned you want to poach people from Alibaba. Who do you want to poach, and why? And then um, uh, I was also going to ask you, you mentioned the true. That, that's a really good question. Let's get the answer to that one. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of people I'm looking for? Because uh, the talent issue is still a really big issue in China, right? Yeah, I think um, um, as a VC, I, uh, part of our jobs is um, you know, helping entrepreneurs to build their teams. And uh, uh, but I can't make decision for the CEO because that's a CEO meant to be. Um, but if the the company is sort of not uh, uh, has a complementary team from the day one, uh, I might have been uh, thinking about how to uh, make the team complementary. Uh, for example, if the CEO is coming from a very technical background and the the product is like a, a 0201, so I'm looking into Alibaba. So, because Alibaba people is very um, uh, good at, you know, um, uh, so-called di tui, I mean, you know, uh, promote their products uh, offline. So, uh, that's uh, one particular area I think Ali ex Alibaba uh, employee are very uh, good at. And uh, similar case with Tencent, the Tencent people are very good at, you know, uh, operating uh, online, uh, uh, developing or curating uh, forums or communities and, and uh, you know, make good product. You also mentioned you were doing a search at uh, Yahoo uh, previously. Yes. And I was wondering, uh, uh, what's the next frontier for search? Um, uh, how and do the next frontier for Yahoo as well. well mm. And how do you <laughs> size up where uh, Baidu in the market? Where do they go from here? Oh, well, that, that, that's a very uh, challenging question. Uh, um, I think we don't see uh, uh, search uh, as an area that a lot of innovation coming out of it, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, um, I think uh, search engine technology per se uh, has already become very you know, developed. And uh, we see what, when we look at what Google is doing is actually extending its footprint uh, into other area of our life. So uh, I think next frontier for uh, search engine, uh, in a bigger sense, is becoming smarter. You know, uh, becoming more in spontaneous and more smarter for people to use it in different scenarios, especially on mobile. And uh, uh, Understanding our needs more, uh, you know, in a more human way. You know, it's not like every time I search, I should put into a keywords and think about keywords to to express my mind, to express my uh, my my needs into a search box. It can be uh, verbal. It can be semantic. Uh, when we talk about semantic web searching, oh, it, it can be social. And uh, um, I hope I couldn't even without asking for it. Google uh, or other search engine uh, knows my needs, you know, be even before I ask. That's uh, the basic, uh, I think, the basic area that uh, search engine tech uh, scientists are working on. But, you know, I hope I understand your, uh, ask your uh, answer your question. Okay. I, I think in the interest of time, we need to wrap up this VC Dealmaker panel. Um, I know uh, there are a lot of people on tight schedules, uh, including Amir. <laughs> Um, but um, I, I um, and it's, it's fine, Amir, if you want to make a 
a quick exit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. He has a flight to catch. Um, but uh, James, uh, don't go away, because I, I want to ask you about the VIE structure. Um, and you can, actually, you can, you can scoot in here. Yeah. <laughs> there's no test. Oh, there's no time. there's no grades for one thing. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, I mean the Alibaba IPO is going to put a lot more attention on the VIE structure, and it already has had a lot of a lot of attention on it. Um, and you know the risks that are associated with it. I mean, do you think? How do you think that this is going to play out? Is it going to be, you know, uh, by default just become the accepted way, that no questions asked going forward, or is, is some? Do you think? Something's going to happen that's going to blow it open, create a lot of more problems going forward. What's your view? So before, you know, when, when, during uh, Alibaba's road show and you know, way before it, you, you see in the U.S. press um, people who are saying negative things about Alibaba. One of the things is Chinese you know, companies based on the SINA model, i.e. VIE model, how, you know, how, how much risk it's involved. And... I think in, in the risk factors, in their perspectives, obviously that's a huge section, you know, different risks about VIE. Um, but the, the, the reality is they, the result of their roadshow is very positive. So I think from a market perspective, people are accepting that this is fine. And as Trump pointed out at the beginning of this panel, you know, the market value of these companies based on VIE structure is just tremendous. I mean, it's, it's for those 10 companies add together, top 10 is more than, it's almost, I think it's close to a trillion dollars. And half of that, we're talking about 500, you know, billion dollars of market value. And I don't think any government can shut that down overnight. I mean, it's, it's just my personal look at it. I mean, they have to find, if they do want to wind this down, they say this is a circumvention of Chinese law or a local law, then they will have to find a way to have a orderly exit out of that structure which means you know, no company will collapse overnight because they're under a VIE structure. It's just been going on for too long. Yeah. So grandfathered? Not sure about that. Okay. Yeah, sure. I think oh, uh, just a couple months ago, and that was kind of a deregulation, right, in terms of the... Now it's become like... The state governments now encourage the company, Chinese co company, go out for IPO, right? Right, and also they are, you know, in terms of the currency, the relaxation on the on the currency control. So we had safe issuing, you know, new new circulars, and then uh, in terms of the foreign government, it, it, the outbound investment um, restrictions are are being lifted. So the general trend is. VIE probably eventually just be a historical relic. It's just going to disappear on its own, just like many other, uh, you know, things that we've seen in the past in, in, the, China, in the development of the Chinese economy. So I think um, the government realized that it's it's a problem. It doesn't look good, but you know, a lot of people are investing in it, including the government itself. Sometimes. So. So as more and more Chinese companies uh, in the tech space become more and more powerful, and they have this huge base to grow from. It, from China, and they're beginning to go overseas, and so many of the China markets are closed uh, to foreign investment. Do you think that these Chinese companies are going to have, you know, a real advantage uh, internationally, longer term? Question and, for and the panel, or or the panel? It's a question for the panel. Helen, uh, oh, let's yeah, have your yeah, view. Yeah, you <laughs> So the question is, um, as BATs, uh, people like BAT get yeah. more money, um, their international strategy, and yeah, their, is they it go out down yeah, they have this huge well, base. And yeah, then, it's interesting. I mean, I was in the Bay Area, and I, I saw, you know, um, office, you know, the BAT are there, and then even Perfect World is there. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like a lot more Chinese companies are expanding into the U.S. Um, and, you know, because I was from, I, I worked in the Bay Area before and then, you know, moved to China about 10 years ago. I think um, it's, it's interesting that they're so ambitious. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a good thing. Um, it's also uh, in certain sectors, like, for example, mobile, uh, like, for example, gaming. Um, I think you do need to be international if you want to, uh, you know, compete. 
uh, because otherwise the U.S. guys are coming to eat your lunch. So, um, so but I think, not necessarily in China. Oh well, if you look at gaming, I mean, you know, some of the um, companies, you know, Supercell, some of these uh, U.S. companies do quite well um, on the Chinese, uh, you know, iOS uh, ranks as well. So I think um, they they do have, you know, unless you're Tencent and you know, uh, one of the few um, guys that are doing very well, you do have to look at uh, your competitors on the global uh, landscape. So so I think um, I think. I can understand why Chinese companies want to go there. I'm not sure how many will succeed because it is a, you know, a big difference um, in terms of the, the culture, um, the user behavior, um, how you do marketing in a different market. So, so it would be interesting to see who can eventually succeed. Yeah. I think, sir, that you brought up something uh, I found very interesting because uh, we, we, have a, we also have a lot of companies that are based in the U.S. But over the last 12 months, that was the first time um, we got several of our U.S.-based portfolio companies call up and say, Chuan, can you please connect me with Alibaba, you know, Tencent, or even Chihu for next round of financing, okay? And the other one is that the one also looking for, uh, like we have a company from Europe, they're also thinking about expanded into China through this. Now, we, we have never seen it before like this. Yeah, a lot more cross-border flows with deals and investments. And a lot of these uh, big China corporates, tech corporates, have venture capital units now in, in Silicon Valley, and they're investing heavily. Any comment yeah. on that, Joshua? I, I, I agree that uh, yeah. a lot of uh, uh, companies from their studying, they want, they're looking to international market and the and the same is true for U.S. companies. They are looking for China, not exactly uh, as see China as a market, but as a, a very big, uh, um, you know, supplier if it's a hardware company. And uh, I think for Chinese big companies like BAT com, uh, overseas, uh, I think uh, um, it will be easier for them if it's a pro neutral product. I mean, if I uh, you, like UC Web, like Clean Master of Cheetah Mobile. Uh, UC Web is, by the way, is another uh, powerful companies of GGV investing, and uh, it has very successful in India and the Brazil, and also it's true for CleanMaster uh, in uh, European, even in US, uh, uh, in Canada. And so, if it's a neutral product, I mean, it's just to uh, solve a particular function, and uh, the overseas consumers, uh, users want concern about the. Uh, the privacy issues and there's no operation, especially offline operation, into these different markets and don't need to, you know, uh, you know, just build up their uh, local teams out there. So that's much easier for uh, Chinese companies to start to begin a space. And I think that's also the suggestion I'm giving other uh, entrepreneurs, uh, especially on mobile end, when they develop their app. If there's a functional, uh, solve a particular problem, that will be much easier for overseas uh, users to adopt. Uh, so Helen, I remember I interviewed you uh, the first time uh, back when you were making, I think, your first investment in China, right? Uh, and that was Tudo. Uh, so what, what uh, you know, what's the what's in your portfolio today that may be on that level? Uh, I guess I'll talk about Timing's portfolio. <laughs> um, oh, okay. it, it, yeah, I mean, a lot of them are actually doing very well. Um, we have. Uh, but is there one in particular that you are keen on? Well, I, I, that's, I know that's really a hard question to ask. <laughs> I think but. Ever. Um, yeah, I mean, Meituxiu Xiu, which I mentioned before, you know, it's, it's, it's really big. I think they have 10 million users a day. Um, you know, just um, a lot of female users taking pictures of themselves and sharing them. Um, and their video app is rising very fast. I think Da Zhong Dianping is very exciting. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's like Yelp. Um, and, they have over the years accumulated a lot of reviews. Um, I think with mobile, um, you know, the LBS function gives them even uh, greater um, greater use experience. Um, so yeah, I think I think um, those two. I think in particular, I, I really like. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Chuan, what's the next uh, Chiho? Uh, no, we haven't made any announcements, so I think I probably just you know uh, very. You have an IPO coming up. 
Yeah, we have another one working on that. Uh, we have won two new uh, Win IPO this year, and uh, we've just had. But all this company, uh, I think, sir, so. I'm more excited about. Um, we recently make an investment in a company called Twanta. Um, this is a more like automobile group buying. You say, come on, what's group buying for automobile, new cars? Um, actually, the company uh, has been doing a great job because they started from Beijing. So now, last month, over 10% of the new cars were sold through that startup company. And based on the next, you know, I mean, the last eight months, uh, the track record this year, the startup company, they're probably, uh, they're going to sell at least 100,000 new cars to that platform. And this is a true internet. Okay. So I, I'm not sure whether this is going to be IPO, when they're going to be IPO. I care less about that. But what is interesting is that it use the internet or mobile to change, help people to buy car more productively. Yeah, interesting. Uh, James, uh, what are you seeing today more on the deal front? Is uh, more IPOs or more M&A? Still more M&A, but I think that the tide is going to change just because, you know, the Alibaba coming out and um, M&O definitely is here to stay. It's, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very, you know, um, simple kind of exit you know, and it's timely. It's, it's much shorter preparation period typically than the IPO. Um, but I think IPO is a big wave is coming. I personally feel that way. Okay, good. L l let's end on that note, and um, because we do want to fit in our e-commerce uh, panel, uh, but let's give our VC deal makers a round of applause, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.